this uh, presentation first. And these are going to be short 10-minute uh, presentations for um, this type of... I, I like to do this maybe once a year, or maybe twice a year, depending on the feedback from the group here. I can get everything plugged up here. So excuse me for being completely unprepared. I'm going to be reading from a script to make sure I'll stay on script. Um, let's start with the simple part. What is All-Star? Everybody has a pretty good idea of what All-Star is. It's an internet linking project for analog repeaters. Not digital. It's analog. So no P25, no D-Star. Right. A lot of people compare this to Echolink. If you're familiar with what Echolink is. Anybody? Yeah. All right. Uh, the difference is, one, the signal originates with a radio. So that's the big thing. You're not going to be using this on your telephone. You're not going to be using it on your laptop. You're going to be using a handheld radio. Uh, and also, probably a little bit better call quality, a little bit better audio quality with AllStar. And we're going to see why in just a minute. So the network is made up of these. <coughs> this is an all-star node. And we're going to show you that an all-star node is basically a radio interfaced with a computer. And that's as simple as it gets. It's a radio interface with a computer. Uh, the layout goes from one radio to another. So if you've got your handheld radio here, you're going to be sending out a signal to another radio, which is going to be converted to a digital uh, signal. It's going to go to a computer, and then through the magic of the internet, it's going to go to a different node. Every node is assigned a number, and that's how you communicate. So you'll notice that this is all done with uh, DTMF codes. I don't know if we can hear this. We'll try it. That's as simple as it is. It's all plugged in. All of it hits a Wi-Fi signal on my phone. So you could use this in a mobile capacity. A lot of people put them in their cars. A lot of people use it for their home Wi-Fi. Um, you can really use it just about anywhere you've got a plug. Or you could go, you know, you could go and put it on a uh, mobile battery pack. The Raspberry Pi in here, the computer part of it, actually uses about five volts. So just about any battery you can think of will run it. Um, we want to focus on that computer because that's an integral part of it. That's the little box we saw in there. That computer is running a software originally designed for PBX, uh, phone exchange, which is why we get better audio quality with that than Echolink. Shortly after that was designed, uh, 99 I think it was, there was an upgrade to it, to a software that became what's uh, currently being used called Asterix. And that kind of enhanced the capabilities of the software and really uh, kind of brought into the modern age. Then a couple guys actually wrote the third level software, the top level software, APP, RPT. The acronyms are not important, but what that does is it lets us interface between the hardware and the software. So that's what actually gives us control over the repeater. These two guys were, um, find their names are important, Jim Dixon, who uh, recently passed away, Whiskey Bravo 6, November, India, Lima, and Steve Rogers, who is still working on the project, uh, Whiskey Alpha 6, Zulu Fox Tango. So the great part about this is one of the things I love, you guys know I'm a big promoter of the Raspberry Pi. This is the computer part of it. This is a single board computer. It's got wireless, it's got USB, it's got Ethernet, everything that you can think of. And it comes in a couple different sizes here. If I can get this case apart, we'll show you guys just how small it is. This one, HDMI, USB, power, everything that you could really want. If, if you're slow as me, you could probably use it as a, uh, a desktop replacement. Uh, these will range you from about $5 for this one, about $35 for this one. This one being a little bit stronger. And question on it? That's 
This one is the Pi Zero. This one is the Pi Zero W, so it's got wireless built onto it. Uh, if you're gonna buy a package, expect to pay probably about 50 bucks for it. So the great thing about this all-star node is that there's no real heavy lifting required, which is what allows us to use these simple computers. This whole box right here has got less than $100 in it, and I can communicate with anywhere there's a node. That could be in Hong Kong or during the hurricanes in North Carolina. This is what I use to call back to North Carolina on two meters and just kind of get an idea of what was going on or eavesdrop on some of the emergency nets so you can get an idea of what's, go what's going on on the ground. I'm gonna open this box back up and show you guys exactly what's happening in here. This is a Baofeng 888, whatever model it is. They're about 11 bucks. You're gonna rip this bad boy apart and pull out your uh, push to talk, your ground. Then it goes through this piece right here. This is what converts the analog to digital signal. And then it pipes right into the Raspberry Pi. And I use it over wireless. It takes up very little bandwidth. And I'm gonna pass one of these radios around while I'm taking any questions on it, just to let you uh, get an idea. You can open this up. Feel free to take a look at, at my messy solder joints. And you'll get an idea of exactly what's going on in there. You could have this entire box made a lot cheaper if you forego this piece right here. This is a custom made piece of hardware. It's called a URI. Some of you may have heard about that. Uh, it basically it acts as a sound card. And you can do that with these little guys right here. These are about $2 a piece. You have to have an extremely steady hand to get in there and solder. I think it's uh, three solder joints you have to have on this chip right here. I tried it three times before I just gave up. <laughs> it did work to a degree, but I found that the URI uh, gave me a lot more consistent results. For so I'll go ahead and open that up to any questions. What do you mean you'll use it for? Uh, fun. It's got to be a repeater if it works. Uh, it's, uh, the network is based on nodes. So I'll use that DTMF code to directly connect to any other node out there. So this so, is d star on the No d star. This is all analog. It works on a uh, voice over IP. So it was originally designed for telephones. They're using this with... Internet background. Okay. Yeah. So it originates with the radio, goes to the radio, works on the video, and it's connected to that black body. The radio? It's a radio, it's going to have two meters away from the band. Well, you, you actually do originate this. I had mine set for 4, uh, 435. Yeah. Okay. So my handheld radio or my mobile radio, whichever radio I want to originate with, actually connects to the bottle phone in the box that's hooked up to the Raspberry Pi. You're still originating via radio, yeah. but that <coughs> that Raspberry Pi is what pipes it out <coughs> voice over IP. And then when it gets wherever it's going, it comes back into the computer, back into a radio, and then broadcasts. So these are pretty low power units, four or five watts. I can just about walk around my neighborhood if I want to walk with the dog or something like that. I can carry this with me and connect to wherever I want to go. Is the box a node then? The box is a node. Okay. Uh, we define a node as any kind of uh, amalgamation, because there's a lot of different mm -hmm. uh, ways out there. But basically, anytime you're putting a radio and interface in that with the computer, mm -hmm. running that asterisk software, you are a node. So how many nodes are there out there, and how do you know uh, who, do you, who to talk to? I guess? How many nodes are there out there? I have no idea. Thousands. <laughs> Thousands. Uh, anybody can do that, so uh, I would say tens of thousands, probably. Go on the web, uh, website, allstarlink, I think it's allstarlink.org. Allstarlink.org will give you an entire list of nodes, who's online, and it'll give you kind of a brief description of what that is. Um, so if you look at, if you find one that says an anti-antenna HOA is the location, that's me. Uh, you can also look by a node number. So I am 46855, and everybody's got that, that personalized number. And that's the code that you'll punch in. So I'll connect in a, a, a star three to connect and then follow by the node number. Yes. 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 Uh, so you're saying the, the digital input that you put, uh, PTMF code, is actually an address to a specific site. 
that how it works? That's right. The software takes care of all of that. I will do star three to connect. Okay. Followed by the node number. So if I want to connect to you know, star three, connect to one. I'll connect you. If anybody else has two, I can install one to disconnect to me. Connect to, to two or star three. The great thing about this is that it's actually you're going to be connected to everybody else you're connected to. So for example, if I were to connect to AJ, anybody else is connected to him, or a proxy is connected to me. And you have the, the capability to get really huge uh, kind of nets, if you will, where you really have no idea who you're talking to. I could, you know, I could connect to him, and he may have somebody in Manchester, England, connecting to him. So all of a sudden, my signal isn't going out to England. So this has nothing to do with repeaters. Uh, not in the strict sense, no. So we don't. Okay. You not at all. Awesome node were connected to a repeater. At all. If there was a node connected to a repeater. Like for example, there's a node connected on the 220 system that Tim Miller has. Okay. If you connect to that node, you're on his radio system. Okay. It may be maybe more helpful to think of this as a repeater. Um, I was going to say that's you a. You can actually get on the Echolink network as well. It's uh, like a virtual repeater, really. Uh, sure. If sure. you that's look at right. it that way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Instead of a radio input, it's got a Wi-Fi input or internet input. That's right. That's right. You could hardwire it. Um, a lot of people use uh, hotspots, mobile hotspots, or their phone if they're doing it mobile. Uh, so anywhere you have an internet. You can send it up. Is there any way to know what frequency the um, the node that you're talking to is broadcasting on? Like, if I had a friend in Nashville, and I was like, "Oh, there's a node nearby you. Like, if you get on this frequency, you'll." I guess you would have to connect it. You'd have to have in the node list. That should be information that's listed. It may or may not be. AJ, do you have another? Yeah. The, for example, I have a hub set up for for Tim's system. And I put right in there that it's the 224-600 KG4HOT system. So if you're looking to get onto that system and you're in Nevada, you would just look through the list, find it, either searching by my call or his call, because both of us are listed in that way. And then once you start transmitting, everybody that's listening on the RF side would, would, would hear it. But again, the frequency isn't really so important on your end. You don't really care what it comes out at, at the, the opposing end. You know that as long as this frequency, and this frequency are the same. Everything else is on there. Yes? How quickly can you get the system up and running? Um, if you start out like me, you don't know what you're doing, hours and hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, given how simple it is, I would probably say, um, I don't know, probably if you put an hour's worth of work into it, you're good. A lot of these images are online. Um, if you guys are familiar with flashing SD cards, uh, what you can do is take a look at this right here. With the Raspberry Pi, everything is stored right here on this. So you'll flash an image. A lot of people put their settings uh, on one image, and you just kind of burn it. If everybody remembers where it's seen, if you burn this right here, just stick it in and away you go. Um, that being said, nothing ever works like it should, and you'll probably have some running curves and, and things to figure out. What um, is the program open source? Yes. And how does program run? Like, is it like an executable kind of file, or is it like it's an image? Nah. It's a, it, it is a, an image file. Um, you're familiar with Linux. Yeah. Everything is uh, everything is. Uh, if, if you've got the right repositories, everything's pretty simple to set up. Okay. Uh, you'll basically just download it. Linux file system takes care of all of that. Uh, I would say the easiest way to do it is still try to find that image file instead of. You know, instead of installing them, just find that image file and burn it through this. So that would be the easiest way. And then you can just set it from there. So that so isn't, like, is that running Raspbian? Is it running? Ra like Raspbian OS? No, no. Um, you can run that parallel to this, but you probably, you don't really need Raspbian. You don't really need the OS to begin with because it's all uh, command line. Okay. So I, I think there's a kind of a rudimentary GUI within Asterix that you can use. Uh, that may be part of that top layer software, the APT, RPT. I'm not really sure about that. Okay. Is, it, is that actually using VoIP protocols to interconnect with one another? It is. It is. That's exactly what the system was designed for. Okay. Uh, it was written, I think, as, a, as an alternative to the more expensive PBS system. So are they running SIP on top of that, too? Or do you know? I'm sorry? Do, are they running SIP to control the uh, session setups or not? I don't know. 
I don't I can't tell you. It's basically an extension of, of an asterisk system is how they set it up. So they're yeah. Does every does every node that's by default set up capable of multi points? Like, like you're saying, AJ is it, a, it you know, should be. It should yeah. be. Multiple people can connect to to multiple nodes. Is there some <clears throat> some rational number limit to that? Not that I'm aware of. No. I don't. I don't know of any limit. Mm -hmm. I know that you can take steps to, to blacklist certain users. Right. Um, of course. Hopefully, it doesn't come to that. But I, I think really they can get as large as as you want. Uh, I also think that most people try to to kind of out of just good operating procedure keep it. Manageable. I think you'll find that it is limited somewhere around 64 because the replication of this packet's got to happen in real time. You're going to be constrained by the processing power. But anyway, it'd be interesting to find the answer to that. I, I really, I don't know as, I don't know as much about the underlying software as I do kind of the hardware side of it. So I'm sure there are constraints. I don't know. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff I don't know. So I'd love to hear. Well, I don't know. I just, I'm just guessing based upon what you're telling me about how it's working. Probably so. Yeah. Probably so. Michael, uh, you said, uh, how do you handle the configuration in terms of the the, the uh, setting your no, your identity into the system? If you're basically dealing with an image, is that the command line that you're doing, or it is? The first thing you need to do is actually go to the All Star website and you'll apply for your node list. They'll give you a couple pieces of information. Uh, when you set up that image file, if you do it via the image, there's going to be a very simple program, a simple configuration where you'll set voice levels, uh, you'll set your node number, your connection, and, and that's kind of a tweaking that you'll need to do to get it working right. Um, you may even find, depending on the radio that you use, you may even find playing around with resistor values kind of helps you out. So you may want a little bit of background with solving to it. Anything else? There is just so you know, there's another guy out there, US Ham, US Hamnet.org, or US Ham.org, I think is his website. He's actually working on a wireless node now, so that all you have to do is give it, tether it off your phone, yeah. and give it a microphone, and you're on the system. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. This Saves all the hassle that you had to go through on the soldering. Yeah, well, really the great thing about this is, is you will hear me push these. I'm a huge proponent for these Raspberry Pis. They're dirt cheap. They're a lot of fun to play with. And this is kind of what, what brings you after your sky's the limit point. These DPIO pins, you can do just about anything with them. Once you bring that all to board, sensors, computers, also a new sky's the limit. So I, I definitely want to push these again. Any other questions? Just, just one last one. In terms of doing the soldering inside the radio, will you why not, is it, what are you getting at that you can't get at through the plug connection? Ignoring this, a prettier package. Okay. Uh, I don't know, you should be able to run it just fine through the plugs. I think there's something, the COR, there's something, there's something you have to get off of it that you can't get out of the normal connection, as I recall. You have to get it off the board. If, for, for the most part, that's true. Yeah. There are some radios that you can plug uh, if you're using the bow phone, that is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the bow phones, I will say that while they are cheap, they are extremely dirty. Uh, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm transmitting on 435, I may also be transmitting on 430. It's, it's really that bad. Don't use it next to a computer, a wireless router, or any... You know, I've got a hardwired USB plug that actually fades in and out if I'm too close to it. Uh, so set it off to the side somewhere if you try. Yeah. Anything else? demonstrations, uh, about 300 uh, kids come out, they camp out there overnight for the weekend, and uh, they have demonstrations that they have to go get their uh, card signed, and our particular one, they have to, we make them spell their name in Morse code, only because I like Morse code, mm -hmm. also because the kids find it uh, pretty amusing. So what we do is, uh, we had uh, Ed, Ed and myself, and then uh, uh, Mike, uh, Scoutmaster, Mike, what's his last name? He 
does our uh, field day. Bob, Bob Robanko. Bob, I'm sorry. Bob, Bob, Bob Romanko was out there in his scout uniform. He helped me get an antenna up in the tree. He's good at that. So uh, for this demonstration, we uh, we brought up I brought up my uh, uh, ten tag rig, and we set up. You see, you see the uh, solar power panel. Mm -hmm. So we got the solar panel charging the battery on the ground, and, um, and then the battery powers the radio. And uh, we showed the kids how uh, solar, you can be off the grid and operate uh, basically without any uh, power. As long as you have sun, the battery takes over when you don't have sun. And hopefully you have sun, a lot of sun. So anyway, the kids came up and uh, each one had to spell their name in Morse code. And we've got a couple of slides here. I think one of them is actually a little video clip. But uh, we also, uh, I had the radio, uh, you can see all the different Cub Scouts. We had 151 kids participate. Because I, the way that I know that is they had to spell their, write out their name first and then do it in Morse code. So I kept, we had a sheet with uh, all the kids that signed up. And you can see the various uh, troops there. But the radio was, um, was basically just to demonstrate ham radio. So before the group got started, we did a little orientation and turned the, uh, turned the radio to a, to a frequency, Morse code or sideband, whatever was coming in. And we had a multiband antenna strung up in the tree, par end fed, that works on 10, 20, and 40. And 20 meters happened to be open that day and happened to be the Pennsylvania Cusa party. So a lot of Morse code coming in. So we showed them how to, you know, I was copying some of the Morse code and I wrote it down, what was, what was coming through. So basically each group came by, came through and it took about 10 to 15 minutes for each group. And we were out there about four hours. So anybody like, like to participate in this uh, next year, you don't have to know Morse code, trust me. Just be there to answer questions. We had some uh, hand, handouts for the kids that uh, Ed had brought back from the uh, ARRL that explains what Morse code, uh, not Morse code, but it, uh, what the ham radio is about and how to contact uh, anybody for help. So hopefully maybe we'll get a few recruits out of this uh, demonstration every year. What's the next time, what's the, when, when will they have it again? October. October. And it's, a, it's unfortunate that it's not time with the Java jam Jamboree on the air. That's the following weekend. Somebody, I don't know if it was somebody from this club, but Ed, was in correspondence with them. Actually, had the kids come over to their house and during that Jada weekend, brought a, the, I guess it was a, a Cub Scout den. But generally, I, I think this is a better <coughs> venue to do that when they're out camping and lots of kids can participate and you can put up antennas and show them how you can operate off of batteries or solar power and things like that. Sort of like field day. In fact, you should actually you should contact the uh, scouts for field day and tell them to come on over, and they can operate on the photo station. Any questions about what we did? What are they? October. Um, okay. Uh, actually, let me see. It might be in my. Thirteen. See it on there? Yeah. Yep. October thirteenth. But that's that was this year. Mm. So I don't know, next year. But it's always I think it's the second. Like the third weekend, whatever the 13th is. All right, so tonight, um, I told, told you all we we're gonna do a hands-on demonstration of, uh, not a demonstration, but you guys are gonna work. Did, did everybody bring, and let me see a show of hands of folks that brought their charging cables. Okay, good. Let me see a uh, show of hands, anybody that brought batteries with them to test. Oh, man. I got, we had more batteries. I got, I got, I got, got one. Got yes. All right, so basically, um, these are tools that are good for not only hams, but also for uh, folks using their homes and uh, to uh, test their, their different cables. And the reason I uh, did this is because I was having trouble with my cell phone batteries years ago when I, I had an old Note 3 or something. 
and uh, it wasn't charging right. So that's how I kind of discovered this, uh, this little device that can tell you the amperage that's drawing and the voltage. Does anybody have one of these? I probably should have known, Dennis. You have one too? Yeah. Okay, only two people? Okay, so you know about that. So anyway, uh, this actually tells you what the battery or what your cell phone battery is drawing in so far as amperage. It also tells you, and this was the, this was the, the, uh, all these cables are not the same. They charge at different rates. Mm -hmm. All right, so you'll see charging cables on there for you know ten for a dollar or something, or you see them in drugstores. You know, check out the counter and they'll have these charging cables and stuff like this. Very, very poor made, poorly made cables. And the reason I know this is because I had them, and that was the reason my cell phone wasn't being charged properly. So um, that's why I wanted you all to bring your charging cables to see uh, how this, these things work on your cell phones. Um, the other test I want to pass around is a, is a battery tester. Does anybody have one of these? You do have one? Somebody shake their head? Yeah, Somebody, I think You it. have one? I have a battery tester. I don't Not know this one. Same. I don't know if it's the same as yours. Okay, hundred bucks. Good. Because, uh, I was hoping to bring something here that a few folks would know about. I started with this one. Okay, this is a smaller version of this company's uh, battery tester. And this is good for uh, most of the common batteries. This baby is, uh, of course, more money, but it tests the coin cell batteries, uh, and it does it very well. Um, so some of, one of the practical applications here is I had... Uh, some uh, EverReady uh, lithium batteries, and uh, I tested them on this, and for some reason they came out with 60%. So I uh, I had some other lithium batteries that were date coded 2022. The new ones were dated 2032. The ones were dated 20, 20 uh, just a couple of years from now. I tested 100%. I said something screwed up here, right? So I wrote to EverReady, and uh, oh, so I'm looking at the batteries, you know, the fine print you see on the batteries? Mm -hmm. The ones that were 60% rated were made in Singapore. Mm -hmm. The ones that I had, I bought years ago, made in Chicago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, in an email, I sent this to EverReady or wherever that cor corporate company is, and it took several weeks to get a reply and they uh, they denied it they sent me a coupon for another pack of batteries <laughs> I went out and bought another pack of batteries guess what in China no Singapore guess what the rating was 60 percent so I said something's got to be messed up so I called this company that makes these things and I explained what person answer, just like the old 10 tech days, where you pick up the phone, talk to the guy that makes them, and he said, no, he said, we calibrate these things specifically for the type of batteries that you're going to test, okay? So that's why this thing is pretty cool. It puts it under a, a load. Now, of course, you could put a light bulb across the battery, test it that way, and then take a bolt meter, but this is, this is, what, co what company is that, Dennis? What? What company made that? Oh, it's, um, um, okay, it's ZTS. They're on the website, and these are their products. So this is the one I have. I have this one and the small one. And um, and they've actually got uh, uh, a sheet. So they're very simple to operate. Mm -hmm. Take your battery, test it like this. So I'm going to pass this around here. While I'm doing that, I'm going to show a few videos of, uh, of these instruments and where to buy them and stuff like this. All right, so I brought I brought three um, three batteries that this the USB thing could work on, and um, they're all rated at two amps or, or more. So most cell phones are not going to be more than two amps. Mm -hmm. So 
the idea here, here is if you have your cable with you and you have a cell phone that's relatively new, it should be pulling about 2 amps, maybe a little bit less. If it's like 0 0.9, you know, not even 1 amp, then that cable is suspect because all three of these batteries are capable of doing 2 amps, okay? So that's the first thing. The other thing is you have these wall chargers that you plug in, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you charge your phones. That's another reason to use these testers. Is your wall charger a piece of junk, all right? That's the other culprit. So folks that, you know, say, oh, I'm going to get a new cell phone, it's, it's dying, whatever. It could all be as simple as a battery or your, your cell phone charger that you plug into the wall or your cable. All right, so I want to go ahead and pass these around. Who's the tester? As you can see, the voltage, that's going to the cell phone, it's 4.79 volt. And the current draw from the charger to the phone is 0 0.55 amp, which is the same as 550 milliamp. Now, if you press the button that's at the top right-hand corner right here, you toggle to different measurements. So this first one we're looking at is a voltage and an amp. Press it once, it'll give you a capacitance measurement. Press it again, it'll give you the power measurement. Now the power measurement is simply the voltage times amp to give you 2.64 watts. So these first three readings are the main measurement this device can take. Now, if you press the button several more times, it'll give you four additional options. But those four additional options, what they do is that allow you to toggle and automatically switch between one display to another. So let me go ahead and press the button once more. Right, now so show you C for capacitance. And in this display, it'll toggle back and forth between the voltage amp and the capacitance reading. All right, here's another cool thing I bought. Because my wife doesn't know about all these things. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta have one of these. Um, so this device, this device puts a load that you can measure exactly on your battery. So you, this, I know it looks like I built it. I did not build it. It's got a little knob on it, and you you turn it. You first you put it into the that uh, measuring device. You plug that into here. Then um, you you uh, you turn up the amperage. So let's say your battery is supposed to be rated at two amps. Okay. I just twist this a little uh, until, uh, until that meter I, I'm passing around reads two amps. If it if it won't go up to two amps, then your battery is is defective. Okay. The other thing you can use it for is with with your chargers that plug in that you plug your charger cables into. This is made by Anchor, and it's rated at two amps. And believe me, it puts out two amps. Okay, you can go to the drugstore or Walmart and buy these chargers for five bucks. Mm -mm, ain't gonna work. So that's what I use this for. And this thing is eight ninety nine. How can you hate it? I sound like one of those commercials late at night. But well, wait, there's uh, more. <laughs> All right. The whole how we relate this back to ham radio is resistance in cables makes a big deal. It also makes a big deal in your RF cables going out to your antenna. Let's say you just spent twenty-five thousand dollars on a nice tower, <laughs> but your your wife your wife does not want the tower anywhere near the house. All right. So you put that tower you put that tower way down toward the end of your lot. Let's say five hundred feet. You're going to run cable out there, and you're going to put this big antenna that's great for reception. And what do you think happens to the signal by the time it gets from that tower down the tower to your radio? It's, you lost you lost all the gain for your twenty five thousand dollar investment. Of course, it depends on the cable you're running I, and the frequency exactly. that you're so, operating. But this, this is how it relates. So you got to make sure that the cable you're running out to that tower is very low resistance. Before you bury it. Before you bury it. And, and make sure you get variable cable. Um, the other reason is uh, like like for you running your, um, your ham radio out of your car, cigarette lighter, if you're running a 100 amp radio, no way. Those cigarette lighters, I think 
most are about, right? The 10 amps? About 12. Am I, is that about right? 10, 10 yeah. About 10 amps, okay? So that's where you have to go hardwire the uh, cable to your battery. But here again, you don't want to have some cheap number 20 uh, conduct, uh, what do you call it? A, what do you call it? A, AWG, whatever. Rated cable, you need a very thick cable, which is about number 10 gauge, 10, 10 or 12, to go out to your battery. So we're only talking about maybe 15 feet at the most here, depending on how big your car is. But that's how it relates back to what, what you're testing right now, okay? Very simple test here, but hopefully everybody could use this test because most people have cell phones, most people have chargers. Are there any questions on this, this guy? This will, oh, let me pass this around. This plugs into that tester. And you can turn that little knob and close it inside of it. All right, so this is another tester for batteries that I have that I did not bring in because it's it's more than I could fit in. I got four minutes left. Um, what this does, you can charge all your bigger batteries, like your, your die-cat batteries, your, your 12 volt uh, gel cells. And what's cool about it is that you can graph the battery over time. So let's say uh, let's say you have a uh, a radio that uh, that draws uh, 20 amps, okay? Well, if you have a, a big uh, battery, uh, what are these marine type batteries? You can put that 20 amp. Uh, these things will will put a uh, some of these loads are 20 amps, but the one I have, I think, is rated at maybe 10 amps. So you can adjust it, and let's say uh, you want to just bring it down to to half, you know, 50 watt radio, so you can bring it down to 10 amps and see how long that battery is going to hold up before it drops down. So you can test the various batteries using this chart, this uh, device, and it hooks up through software to your laptop. So let's say, let's say you have these AA batteries that you buy from Sam Club or Costco. So I did a test with the ones from Costco versus Sam Club, and the ones from Costco, I'm talking about one and a half Double A batteries, simple batteries. I ran uh, 100 milliamp uh, load on it, and it's got it's got a graph on it. And uh, anyway, I was able to determine how long each battery lasted, which which brand lasted more. And guess which one lasted? How many think Costco? How many think uh, Sam Club? It was Costco. Costco batteries. Are rated better than the Everetti or the Duracell or the Sam Club or any of those other batteries. All right, so that's a cool thing. All right, another thing my wife doesn't know I have. Yes. Um, it says solar panel testing in the description of that. Have you tried testing solar panels? With oh yeah, yeah. So you uh, you can test the output of the solar panel to your battery, and those are different devices that they actually ham radio operators use in the field, especially guys that do QRP work. Yep. Uh, this device is sort of like that little tester that I'm passing around, only it's more sophisticated and it will memorize the total amperage as you're operating. So let's say uh, you're out for field day and you've got a battery, this device will uh, will memorize how long you've had it and then and then load it. My, my little QRP radio, the KX2, actually has the amperage meter as long as the battery is connected to it, it will it will keep that in the memory, so you know how much your capacity you've used out of that battery. I know this is all trivial stuff, some of you, uh, but I thought you know many many of you folks may not have seen these these gadgets, and uh, that's why I wanted to present it. Yes, sir. Totally new to all of this, so I appreciate everything that you're saying. Okay, great. I hope you learned something. Don't, don't forget about the one for your car charger. Yeah. And I would advise getting, expensive is not the most, uh, uh, necessarily the best. Um, let me show you a little thing that I use here for. What, what's that, before you get rid of that one, what, what's that one worth, uh, the CBA4 there? Oh, okay. The Silverado is for the... They're, they're, uh, they're over $100, so about $150. Okay. 
they come with software and it's upgradable software. So if they come out with new things. But you can test a whole range of batteries with that right. thing. Yes. So would that be uh, available to test your handheld batteries um, for, for the HDs? Oh, your, H, your HDs? Yeah, you could do that. You'd have to probably figure out uh, alligator clips or something to hook up to your HD battery. Yes, you could do that, sure. Because those are lit most of those are lithium batteries. Um, so up here, at this Amazon site, you see this? It says fake spot grade. Couple points, that voltage meter thing you passed around, yep. I have something very similar, but it will also keep track of the amp hours you use. Yes. And I found all the USB cables are not created equal. They right. get good ones and bad ones. And a lot of phones now have their own like smart power fast charger, like some of the Apple's. Yes. And it'll charge it really rapidly and it'll keep track. But if you plug it into a regular charger, it'll, it'll right. charge that's, very slowly. That's a good, that's a good point. The, yeah. the charger that comes with your phone is, is probably the best one to use, although Anchor claims that the, and actually the Anchor products are pretty good too, uh, the claims that they you put out, but uh, I always like to test things, and so that's why I got these gadgets. Yeah, but I think the phone knows its own charger because I've got a Motorola and Marcia's got a Nexus, and they're both smart chargers, Right. and if I try to use my charger on her phone or vice versa, it won't recognize. So it's got to have some way that it, it recognizes the unique charger. Um, I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> but, you, you, but you have the tester, and the tester is showing that it's, it's pulling, putting it on two amps or whatever. Yeah, so. it, it's not? No, it, de it defaults to a slow rate. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. But the phone will pull, should pull whatever the charger is putting out. Yeah. So if you got a you know, a two amp capacity backup. I'm sure two amps. Anyway, so I'm going to yell. Uh, I think uh, about nine months ago, uh, I, this is a, uh, a reproduction of the famous NorCal 40 transceiver. The NorCal 40 was developed in about uh, the mid 90s by a guy named Wayne Burdick, who went on to found. Telecraft, and uh, this is a superhead using uh, any 602 mixers. I don't know, right? you, you probably don't know about those, but it's, it's, it's a mixer that, there's four of them in here. There's a transmit mixer, receive mixer, product detector, one other, I don't know. Um, but the K2 uses a lot of any 602 mixers. And th this design is just basically the beginnings of the K2. Uh, so I got hold of seven boards that were reproductions of the original board uh, approved by Wayne Burdick. And I distributed them to seven people who expressed interest. I won't name them because I don't want to embarrass any of them because a lot of people haven't built them yet. I hope they're all blushing. Uh, but several of us did build them and it's a really neat little two watt 40 meter transceiver. This one happens to be 30 meters because I've got my original 40 meter and I wanted to build it for another man. It's got issues. Um, it needs a redesign of the, of the band pass filter. But anyway, uh, it's something that we built and uh, I'm going to start another project um, if there is interest, which is a kit uh, that comes from England. I think it's QRP somebody. It's a really classy, uh, this, is, this is yesteryear's technology. Uh, the next one is going to be what I think is the best example of a direct conversion transceiver. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guys that are kidding it, but uh, they, it, it's just really outstanding. And it costs 50 bucks. The kit costs $50. Oh. So if anybody's interested in the group build of that one, uh, I strongly recommend it. And 
you can get in touch with me and I'll send you the information. We can build it together. Bill, you, you didn't point out the best part of that. CW. Yes. Oh, yeah, well, all these things are CW. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All these things are CW. Uh, and so uh, we were having a big CW enthusiasm <laughs> love fest here uh, that sort of corresponded with this project. And the next skit that I'm talking about is also CW. Um, and if you're willing to build the kit, uh, I'm willing to participate in a CW class or help you get up to speed or whatever. Uh, and anyway, that's what I got to say. Thank you. See, yeah, I, I saw at least one other hand come up of somebody who brought something. Go ahead and stand up front well, and tell us about it. I didn't plan it, but it's, this will just take a second. Um, A month or two ago, somebody sent something out on the mail list about an article about using Morse code on your cell phone. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I did a little research. There was a woman at IBM or Apple or someplace that had, she was paralyzed from the neck down. So they picked her up with some switches and she sent Morse code with her head like this. Ooh. And it got a group together and they built it for the phone. And my big fat thumbs just don't work on these little teeny tiny <laughs> keypads. And you know, you correct it and you back up and you try it again. So, <laughs> so I thought I was the only one who had that problem. Yeah, so <laughs> that thing built is. into the Google keyboard is like a foreign language thing. So you could uh, have English, French, English, Italian, English. Warrock layout or English and Morse code. So you go through the deal and you set it up and there's two big keypads here about the size of a postage stamp. And I can hit those with my thumbs fairly accurately. <laughs> so I don't know if you can hear, but, but listen here. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You know, just music by ears. My thumbs never left my hand. Try it out. Any anybody else? What's there? <coughs> what is it called? Was it good? It's Google key, Keyboard. Um, I sent out something to the mail list a month or two ago. I'll see if I still find it and, and resend it. But you, um, Apple's Apple's got it, and most of the Android phones have it. So uh, it's really easy to set up. Yeah. The the link to that is in the dots and dashes. Say again. The link to the story is in the dots and dashes. Oh, okay. Jim. Good. Page eight. Yeah. So it's saving. So I can actually now, you know, use my phone for texting. Not fast. But. Okay. And any others?